welcome back everyone for the afternoon session uh mr klingla will continue his series of lectures on hodge theory algebraicity and transcendence thank you so um let me uh, recall where we stopped yesterday so yesterday i explained i stated the main result that uh, i would like to uh, study in the remaining uh, three lectures so uh, and this is about hodge loci so if you have a polarized variation of that structure uh, on a smooth quasi-projective variety, uh, the Hodge locus uh, is uh, the set of points where you have exceptional Hodge tensors appearing in the fiber. And uh, the general result of uh, Catani, Dolin, and Kaplan is that this is a countable union of algebraic uh, sub-varieties. And this result is already a bit surprising if you think of it in terms of period maps, because uh, period maps are only um, analytic. And um, in view of this theorem, then you can ask what is the geometry of uh, this countable union of algebraic varieties. And uh, actually what I want to show is that there is a big difference between uh, variations of that structure of small level, like one and two, where uh, usually uh, this large locus uh, is even analytically dense. And uh, in level three, where we prove with Baldi and Ulmo that at least if you look at the positive dimensional components, uh, then actually this locus is algebraic. So it's not a countable union, but uh, it's contained in a, a finite union of uh, irreducible algebraic subvarieties. And in particular, this applies to uh, this uh, variation of our structure that you obtain for a family of hypersurfaces of degree D uh, in Pn plus one. Okay, so this was the statement yesterday. And uh, today what I want to do is in some sense, a completely, uh, a bit completely different topic. Um, uh, in the sense that I want to introduce one of the main tools that has uh, been developing in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years in Hodge theory. So um, this will be uh, lecture three. And so this will be about tame geometry. So Hodge theory. And tame geometry. And here, uh, the idea is that, uh, okay, uh, period maps are not algebraic because already their targets uh, are not algebraic varieties in general. But nevertheless, uh, you can hope that uh, they are not far from having the nice topological properties uh, that uh, algebraic, uh, algebraic maps have. And this is indeed what tame geometry will provide. So uh, let's, let's start with this. So suppose, and so motivation, so suppose uh, we have um, um, a variation of a structure uh, v uh, uh, over s uh, z vhs then uh, out of this we know that we get a period map from s n to uh, this hodge variety which is uh, analytic so, and I mentioned yesterday that if the level of V is uh, strictly larger than one, then uh, D mod gamma has no algebraic structure. And phi is a mere uh, analytic map. Or maybe not. Right, so maybe maybe phi looks like uh, an algebraic map. So basically, what we want to exclude uh, are the uh, innumerable uh, pathologies that complex analysis uh, has, and this is what I want to explain now, and what it means to look like an algebraic map. So uh, I will talk first about tame geometry. <clears throat> so what is tame geometry uh, about? Well, uh, the idea was introduced by Grotendieck, and basically uh, the idea is uh, the following, is that uh, you would like uh, discard uh, to discard uh, all the wild uh, 
uh, topological phenomena. Uh, that you encounter when you do a basic general topology like Cantor sets. So you you would have a, you would like to have a nice geometric setting where uh, Cantor sets, piano curves, this kind of pathologies uh, do not occur, but uh, even much more uh, usual uh, monsters. So of course I shouldn't call them monsters; they exist. But the, convic the conviction of Grothendieck is that those monsters exist for the need of analysis, not really for the need of geometry. And uh, so uh, what, are, what is a typical uh, monster? So a typical uh, monster, of course, the terminology is not really uh, nice, but it's a wild phenomenon. The typical monsters that you want to exclude, uh, I think you have to keep in mind this example. Um, so suppose uh, you take as as, uh, as an object uh, you take uh, the graph gamma of the function x gives uh, sine one over x for x uh, positive real number. So you have this uh, very fast oscillating function, right? I will not try to to um, to 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 make a picture because of course um, I will not succeed. But you have this very fast oscillating function in this band between minus one and one, uh, uh, which is uh, just collapsing on an, a, a closed inter vertical interval. So uh, what is the closure of that thing? Well, the closure of that thing is just this uh, closed uh, vertical interval union uh, gamma itself. The graph. And uh, um, so now I claim that this guy is a monster. Why? So uh, for at least three reasons. So um, so gamma is a monster uh, for at least reason. So the first reason is that uh, gamma bar is uh, its closure. It's a typical example of set which is connected. but not arc connected. So if you believe that geometry is about drawing picture, uh, this is a bad guy. Okay, this is a minor problem maybe, but uh, a more serious problem is the fact that uh, the dimension of the boundary, so the boundary is just this vertical interval. And uh, so the dimension, whatever your notion of dimension, it has to be one, right? It's just this uh, vertical interval. But this is also the dimension of the graph. So if you have a set whose boundary has the same dimension as the set itself, then uh, this is very bad because this means that you can't have any stratification theory. And so this means that basically any proof by induction, uh, any geometric proof by induction will fail. So no stratification theory. So this is not good for geometry. And uh, a certain, uh, a third way of seeing that uh, this guy is a monster is that if you take the intersection of that graph uh, with R, then of course, uh, this is an infinite countable set, right? You are just solving the equation sine one over X is equal to zero. So you get this infinite countable set which means that uh, it is not a finite type. You need uh, an infinite amount of uh, information to describe that set. So again, this is bad for uh, geometric theory. So uh, what you would like, you would like to construct uh, a geometric setting where these kind of guys do not appear automatically. So what is a prototype of a nice uh, geometry? And nice now will be called tame. So the prototype of tame geometry is uh, semi-algebraic geometry. So this is real semi-algebraic uh, geometry, where all these phenomena uh, do not occur. If you take a semi-algebraic set, then its closure is still semi-algebraic. And the, for instance, the boundary is of strictly smaller dimension. You have a nice stratification theory, and so on and so forth. So uh, maybe I will not recall uh, uh, too much about uh, semi-algebraic geometry, but uh, uh, another nice property is that if you take any semi-algebraic set, um, uh, then uh, actually it has uh, finitely many connected components. So this is a finite type theory. 
So the problem of uh, uh, of real semi-algebraic geometry is that it's too close to algebraic geometry to be really useful in our context. After all, um, you're just uh, allowing uh, inequalities, but the only functions you play with are polynomials. So as uh, is not good enough, so this is too close to algebraic geometry to be really useful. Uh, in transcendental context. So uh, you would like a much more general setting. And actually, uh, uh, there is an axiomatic approach which was developed by model theorists uh, essentially at the same time where Grotendieck was dreaming about uh, this same geometry. And the name is uh, O minimal structures. And so now I want to uh, say a few words about that. So the good thing is that you don't need any model theory. It's just uh, purely a topological setting, but you do it in an axiomatic way. So let me recall some basic notions uh, about uh, structures. So what is a structure? A structure is uh, you give yourself the collection of all sets in Rn you are, you are allowed to play with, basically. So a structure is nothing else, uh, is a collection. Curved S. So this will be a collection Sn for N in N, where Sn uh, is a set of subsets of Rn. Okay, so this is just a set uh, uh, of subsets in all dimensions that you want to consider. This will be the nice guy in, in your geometry. And what are the requirements about those sets? First of all, you want the algebraic subsets of Rn uh, are in Sn. So that's a minimum. So uh, importantly, notice that everything will be over R. The complex numbers uh, do not occur here, and we'll see why in uh, a few minutes. So as uh, a second, so you have a few axioms coming just from set theory. You want to be, you want Sn to be a Boolean, Boolean subalgebra of the power sets of Rn, which means that Sn is stable under uh, finite intersections, finite unions, and complement. Okay, so this is very reasonable. Uh, third property is that you want uh, uh, stability in the products. So this means that if A is in SP and B is in SQ, then you want that uh, A times B is in SP plus Q. Good. So up to now, not much geometry. But the fourth axiom is geometric. You want uh, those collections of sets to be stable and the linear projections. So if you have uh, a linear projection from Rn plus 1 to Rn, and uh, so linear projection. And uh, if you start with a set, which uh, you are allowed to play with in dimension uh, n plus 1, then you want that uh, p of a, its projections, uh, is in Sn. So that's the, fourth, uh, the four axioms for uh, structure. And now you have to think that those axioms are really quite tricky. So first of all, uh, you see that uh, algebraic sets do not form a structure because of that fourth axiom. Because if you project an, an algebraic set under linear projection, then usually you do not get something algebraic. You get something semi-algebraic. So the simpler example of a structure uh, is actually uh, the collection of semi-algebraic subsets of Rn. And uh, obviously, they satisfy two and three. This is really a structure. So. Um, and uh, you have to think that this force axioms is kind of tricky because it creates a lot of uh, definable sets in the sense that if you uh, decide that uh, one set is in S2023, then all its linear projections to smaller dimension becomes automatically uh, uh, elements in your structures. In your structure and so uh, this is kind of a tricky uh, axiom so uh, now uh, let me um, just finish my definition with some terminology which is that the elements of sn for n in n are called uh, the s definable sets so the, the sets which are definable in your structure
Okay. So these are the guys, basically these are the only guys that you are allowed to uh, look at in Rn. And uh, now, uh, once you have the sets, you can define what is, fun what is the uh, definable function. So if f is a function from A to B, then you say it is uh, as definable if uh, its graph is as definable. Right, there is this kind of duality between uh, sets and functions. Here, I've de I decided to uh, define a structure using sets. And uh, if you have uh, all the sets you are allowed to play with, then you say that a function uh, is part of your game if its graph uh, is definable. So as I said, uh, the typical examples are um, the easiest example. Uh, you can take uh, what is called R alg. So this is the structure uh, uh, of semi-algebraic sets. And you have to notice that, uh, as I said, uh, the axiom four saying that uh, the projection of semi-algebraic set is semi-algebraic, uh, linear projection is, has these properties, uh, what is usually called, uh, I mean, this is the tarski seidenberg theorem in that setting. Okay, so that's one example. Uh, another example, well, actually, you can construct as many structures as you want. This is not very constraining. Why? So suppose uh, for any, uh, so you can define a structure uh, that we call RF for F, any collection of subsets of or functions. Uh, from Rn uh, to Rn. And the point is that uh, this is, uh, you can define that because um, uh, just using the fact, so this is the smallest structure that all the subsets that you prescribe or all the functions that you prescribe uh, are definable in that structure. And this makes sense because if you look at the definition, then you see that the intersection of two structures is a structure. So it makes sense to speak about the smallest structure um, containing a given collection of sets of functions. And uh, for instance, uh, that way you get a number of uh, structures. You can get uh, uh, Rx. So this is the smallest uh, structures that the graph of the real exponential is a definable set. And uh, you can take uh, R sine, where you also want the graph of the sine to be uh, definable. And you can also take uh, a, a structure which is called Rn, where here uh, this is um, the structure defined by adjoining uh, all uh, real uh, real analytic functions uh, defined on compact sets. Any, so I would say the structure generated by uh, real analytic functions restricted to compact sets. So you, of course, you restrict it to compact sets. Okay, so these are examples of uh, functions. So of course, uh, this is uh, maybe not uh, uh, that useful for us because for example, we know that in R sine, there is sine one over X and we know that this is not a good guy. So uh, this is not enough. Uh, so let me maybe mention uh, a, few, a few facts. So, uh, which are useful if you want to develop uh, such a theory and make it nice. So, and uh, if you want these are exercises, just starting with those definition, uh, you have to prove that if you have a definable set in some structure, then actually uh, its closure, its interior and its boundary are also definable. And uh, if you think about it, you would see that uh, it's just because uh, the usual topology in Rn is defined using a, a semi-algebraic form, namely uh, the distance function, the Euclidean distance function is given by uh, a polynomial, okay, in the coordinates. And so this is, uh, and polynomials are definable in all, in any structure by definition. So um, uh, another property which is important is that if you have a functions from A to B, uh, which is definable, then you can show that this implies that f of a and f minus one of b are definable. 
And uh, uh, last exercise to prove that uh, the composition of definable functions is definable. And your structure implies that G composed with F is definable. So when I write definable, this means that uh, I implicitly uh, say that uh, I'm working inside a given structure, okay? So as I said, uh, this definition is okay, but it's essentially set theoretic and it does not put any strong restrictions about uh, the collections of sets you are playing with, essentially because of this fourth axiom. So now what I would like, I would like to have a fifth axiom that is a kind of constraining uh, the fourth one. And uh, uh, the idea that people uh, got is the following. So, so a structure S is said to be O minimal if um, you have the addi additional uh, following axiom, if uh, fifth um, any element in S1 is semi-algebraic. So in other words, uh, 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 you want that in dimension one, so in R, there are no more uh, definable subsets than just finite union of points and intervals. And then now you see that this is very constraining. It plays against uh, the axiom four, because if you decide to include in dimension 2023, a new set in your, in your structure, then by linear projection, it creates a lot of things in dimension one, just by taking all the possible projection uh, to dimension one. And it's very easy this way to actually get a counter set. And uh, uh, axioms five uh, forbids that. So uh, example, well, uh, our alge, of course, uh, is O minimal. Semi-algebraic sets, uh, by definition, uh, if you take only the collection of all semi-algebraic sets, then uh, in S1, you have only semi-algebraic sets. So this is tautological, but uh, our sin is not. Exactly, because the graph of sine one over X, uh, 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 the set of zeros in uh, of sine one over X, if you want, uh, is not uh, definable in dimension one, because this is this infinite countable union. If the function sine is definable, then sine uh, the, the set of zeros should also this set of zeros should also be definable. Okay, so uh, that's nice. At least we see now that we have some constraints. So there are two uh, questions. First of all, is to understand why an O minimal structure actually enables you to do uh, tame geometry, and the second question is uh, basically uh, are there good examples? So. Uh, so I don't have much time, so I don't want to uh, uh, go too far into the tameness properties, but I want to indicate a few uh, fundamental results. About tame geometry that give you an idea of what happens. So the first result is uh, describes the definable function. So you can, the, the first question you have to ask is, suppose I, I have a, an O minimal structure, can I describe uh, the definable functions from an interval to R in the structure? Okay. So this theorem is called monotonicity. And it says the following. Suppose uh, F from A to B, from A, B, from an open interval A, B to R uh, is definable. And by this, I mean in some O minimal structure. So from now on, uh, the only structure I would consider are uh, defined uh, the O minimal ones in some O minimal structure. Then the claim is that you understand pretty well this kind of function, namely there exists A0 smaller than A1. I'm oh, sorry, I should uh, say A0 is A, and uh, this is smaller than A1, smaller than A2, smaller than a AN is equal to B, such that uh, F, in restrictions to AI, AI plus one is continuous. And uh, either constant on that interval or strictly monotonous.
right? So it means that if you make uh, a picture, uh, so you have your function on AB. And then what I'm saying is that you would get some partition, some finite partition, such that uh, on each of those uh, things, you will get something like this. So maybe here it is constant and maybe here it's, uh, it's uh, decreasing. Oh, sorry, my decreasing function is not really strictly decreasing. So let's make it strictly decreasing and uh, something like, oh, maybe I should. And here, uh, the value at the points could be that one, that one, and that one. So you will get a function like this, which is pretty nice, actually. Okay. So it's also not very hard to prove. So it's a nice exercise if you, if you have some time to just starting from the axioms to prove this. And actually, uh, you can go further. You can prove that whatever uh, the num the positive number p you give yourself, you can uh, get exactly the same result, uh, saying that uh, there is a partition, a finite partition, such that f is actually a cp on each uh, open interval of that par partition. Um, and, and something I should notice is that there exist o minimal structures where you cannot put p equal infinity. So it's not true in general that you can ask, ask that it is C infinity in restrictions. But every finite um, level information actually can get. OK, so that's the first fundamental result. It tells you that actually those functions are qu quite familiar. And notice that this is very nice, because in your definition of a structure, there is no continuity anywhere. Right? I mean, it's not in the axioms. Um, the second theorem that I want to mention, and this is actually the crucial one that enables you to make the entire theory work, is the following. So this is called the decomposition theorem. Is that suppose you have a collection, a finite collection A1, AK uh, in Rn, uh, and each of them is definable in some O minimal structure. Then uh, the claim is that um, there exists what is called a cylindrical definable cellular decomposition. So CDCD CD of Rn such that each AI is a union of cells. And uh, we'll see soon that in this CDCD, there are only finitely many cells. So this is redundant to say, it, but let me emphasize it, is a finite union of cells. So of course, now I have to describe you uh, what is what kind of uh, decompositions are those CDCD decomposition. So uh, a CDCD decomposition of Rn, well, uh, you do you define them by induction. So for n is equal to one, so you want a, a, a cylindrical definable cellular decomposition of R1. Well, this is just giving yourself uh, exactly this kind of finite uh, collections of number. And then the cells are uh, exactly the points AI and the intervals. Um, AI, AI plus one. And of course, here you have to put A zero is equal to minus infinity and uh, AN plus one is equal to plus infinity. So just a basic def uh, basic uh, decomposition of R, but on with only finitely many cells. And now in higher dimension, uh, so for N larger than one, uh, what is uh, uh, CDCD of RN? Well, uh, you, it's the same thing as giving yourself a CDCD of Rn minus one. And plus uh, for each cell of Rn minus one, let's call it C, this uh, cell. No, sorry. of Rn minus one, 
you give yourself, uh, uh, so this is a cell, you are in, this is your cell C in R n minus one, but you give yourself, you give yourself a finite collection of uh, functions that you can suppose to be strictly monotonous and uh, continuous. And then uh, what are the, uh, so F C I plus one. And so what are the cells here? Well, the cells here are just uh, either uh, the bands between the graph of those two functions. So each F C I is strictly smaller than F C I plus one. And the cells are either the bands or the graph of the functions. And this is, this is why this is called cellular because this is over a decomposition in y dimension less. So the cells of Rn are the bands. Cell in Rn minus one or graphs. Okay. And uh, that's it. And uh, the, so the theorem tells you that uh, if you give yourself finitely many uh, definable sets in R, and you can always get a global decomposition of that shape such that each AI is a union of cells uh, 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 like that. But uh, it has a, a remarkable corollaries is that, uh, first of all, uh, if A is definable, and here again, I'm thinking in terms of uh, definable in some of the immunal structure, it tells you automatically that it has finitely many components. Right, because you know that this A is a union of cells and this is a finite union. So that's it. And moreover, and uh, this implies this, and any connected component is uh, definable itself. And uh, second is that it tells you that you have the property you wanted, namely that the dimension of the boundary is strictly uh, smaller than uh, the dimension of uh, your set. Just because your set A, you can write at this union of cells and then for cells, it's obvious that the boundary is one less dimension. Okay. So uh, uh, you already see that this theorem implies nice uh, tameness properties and actually uh, there are many more and uh, I, I don't want to enter this into too, too many details. Uh, there are very good reference about that. So now uh, to answer the second point is that you need interesting examples because up to now the only minimal structures that you know, are, uh, uh, sorry, what happened? Uh, the only example that you know uh, is R alg. So, uh, well, non trivial examples, well, you have this Rn. So, if you take the structure generated by uh, all real analytics uh, functions, but restricted to compact sets, this is crucial, uh, then actually you get an O minimal structure, which is uh, um, uh, already remarkable, remarkable. And what are the definable sets? So the definable sets actually are what are called globally. So I will just put a name for those who know that fine. The other ones can look on Wikipedia about the definition. Definable in that structure means globally subanalytic. And the fact that this is O minimal uh, is essentially Gabrielov theorem. So Gabrielov theorem tells you that the complement of a subanalytic set is subanalytic. Okay. So uh, another structure which is remarkable, and this is where everything happens for us, is our exp. So strangely enough, uh, 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 these ominous structures, uh, they allow you to play with the real exponential. Uh, and this is a major progress because of course, with the real exponential, you are very far from. Sure. Yeah. I don't hear you, uh, I'm sorry. So when you define Rn as adding all analytic functions on compacts. In particular, this implies that every compact will be definable. 
No, when I say compact, I mean, uh, I should be more precise. I, I mean on cubes, if you want. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sure. All right. So uh, a major progress is when you do it with Rx. So uh, this is a result which is due to Wilkie. And he was using uh, model theoretic uh, methods for proving this. Um, uh, but the, uh, a crucial ingredient is uh, the theory uh, uh, of Kovansky. So this is really uh, uh, um, uh, a remarkable uh, result of Kovansky that tells you that if you look, uh, so if you look at the set of X, let's say you look at so let me indicate briefly uh, one tameness property, which is really remarkable. Suppose you fix yourself a polynomial in 2n variable, and you look at the set of x1, xn, such that uh, your polynomial in 2n variable uh, um, look at this. Let's look at this set. And then a basic result of Kalinsky tells you that if you look at these collections of this, then uh, the pi zero of such a set is finite. So the cardinality of that set is, uh, which is very hard if you think about this, right? You give yourself just a polynomial, you and as input you put x one x n and uh, uh, and uh, their exponentials. There are a priori absolutely no reason why uh, this set should have only finitely many uh, components. But this is, a, in some sense, this is an incarnation of the fact that this structure is O minimal. Okay. Um, so, of course, I'm going uh, really fast. But here, uh, what is important, so for instance, you see that functions like x to the power alpha or exponential uh, minus 1 over x for x uh, larger than zero, and here alpha is irrational, you see that those functions, they become definable in that structure. And this is kind of very reasonable. If you think of exponential minus one over x, when you do calculus, this is basically uh, the first example of an a priori uh, nasty function, which has actually is kind of very pretty. Uh, if you look at what happens uh, close to zero, this is uh, this kind of nice. Okay, and uh, okay, so now the structure we'll always be working with is the following, uh, which actually you can put those two together. You can uh, ask that all real analytic functions restricted to uh, boxes, uh, compact boxes uh, are definable and also the real exponential. And actually this still defines an O minimal structure. Here, this is non-trivial because if you take the structure generated by two O minimal structures, in general, it is very far from being O minimal. But yes, this is true, and this is the result of Miller and Van den Dries. Okay, so uh, now uh, for applications to geometry, uh, I should say a few words about globalization. Maybe I will not write it. Uh, you can globalize this as always in geometry, namely if you want to define, uh, give, suppose you have given yourself uh, uh, um, a definable structure S, then you want to define what is an S-definable topological space. And then you are just asking that this is a topological space endowed with a finite atlas of charts. Finite is crucial, such that is each of those charts are definable uh, in your uh, in your O minimal structure, and the change of coordinates are given by definable functions. But you have to remember that you want only finitely many charts because if you allow uh, infinitely many, then you 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 will lose all the advantages of the O minimality stuff. So typical examples, uh, so examples of um, you know, definable spaces. Well, of course, if you take uh, an algebraic variety of a R, uh, algebraic, then uh, actually uh, X of R is a definable topological space uh, in R alge. And the reason is that you just cover X by finitely many uh, fine uh, charts. 
And then uh, on these fine charts, uh, when you take the real points, then you get uh, real algebraic sets and uh, the change of coordinates are semi-algebraic. So that's fine. And so, of course, now, uh, if you take uh, X over C, uh, you can do the same. Uh, X of C is also uh, uh, definable in R algebra because you just look at it as being the restriction from C to R of X and take the R points. So that's also fine. So now uh, the question is, uh, uh, why should a geometer care? Right? Uh, why is that uh, interesting for uh, algebraic geometers? And the reason is that, the main reason is that uh, you have fantastic uh, algebraization results. So, uh, so because of, so let me, there are two kinds of algebraization results. Uh, one is a Diophantine criterion. And this is really uh, beautiful and remarkable. So this is due to uh, P-line Wilkie. So, and this is the following uh, uh, theorem. So suppose you start uh, with uh, a definable subset of Rn. So from now on, as I said, definable in some, on, in some ominous structure. Then what I would like, I would like to, uh, uh, to have a criterion to be sure that this definable set uh, contains some semi-algebraic subset of positive dimension. So let me call uh, the alge uh, the union of all positive uh, dimensional semi, uh, well, uh, connected uh, semi-algebraic subsets. of uh, Z. And I would like a criterion to say that uh, this guy is not empty. And the criterion uh, will be uh, Diophantine in the sense that uh, I would just count points uh, in Q to the N intersecting uh, the complement. So the claim is that uh, for all epsilon larger than zero, there exists a constant C epsilon, such that uh, if you look at the cardinality, so I want to count points. So I take the X in Z minus Z alge, so the guys which are not contained in semi-algebraic subsets, and then I intersect with Q to the N. Now, uh, usually this is an infinite set. Uh, I have to uh, have a finite number, so I bound by the height. So I ask that the height of X, so I think uh, yesterday, I mean, you, you had an introduction to height. So here is just a, a naive height on Q to the N. Uh, and I ask that uh, the height of X is smaller than a T. And then uh, the theorem of pillar will kit is used that in this non-algebraic part, there are very few uh, uh, rational points. Uh, there are less than uh, C to the epsilon, which is a constant time T to the epsilon, right? So this theorem tells you that if you count uh, the rational points in Z and you found that this number of points with respect to the height uh, is at least polynomial, then this means that actually uh, there is a non-trivial positive dimensional semi-algebraic subset contained in your, uh, in your Z. So a typical example, the simplest example is just, for example, well, uh, take a box uh, 0, 1 cross 0, 1, okay? Then uh, you draw uh, your favorite real uh, analytic curve. And now you count uh, the rational points. So the points in Q square on this curve. So if uh, C intersected with Q2 contains many uh, points, and by many, I mean at least polynomially many in the height, then actually uh, C is a real algebraic. So you see that this is really a beautiful result because it's going in the opposite direction of what usually algebraic geometers do. 
algebraic geometers, they start uh, with varieties defined over Q, and then they try to understand what are the Q points. Here, there is no algebraic variety. You just have a definable subset of Rn. And I'm telling you that uh, actually, if you count points, of course, you have to be definable. If you count points uh, which are rational, if you have a lot of them, then there is a good reason for that. And the good reason is existence of positive dimensional uh, algebraic subsets. So that's the first uh, uh, algebraization criterion. The second one is uh, uh, the relation with complex analysis. And here, um, basically, the motto, uh, the motto is that uh, uh, all minimal structures are not compatible uh, with the pathologies of uh, complex analysis. So let me give a, a very simple example of, of that statement uh, in dimension one. So uh, suppose uh, you have the following lemma. So suppose, suppose I consider a map from a punctured disk to C, and, uh, which is holomorphic. So delta star is a punctured disk of uh, radius one, if you want. So, and uh, now I also assume that this map is definable in some ominous structure. So this makes sense because uh, delta star, I think this guy, uh, I think C as being R square and delta star is given by a polynomial inequality. Just of, uh, just X square plus Y square smaller or equal to one. And, and, and also I remove the, uh, the, the point zero, zero. Okay. So this makes sense. And then the claim is that, uh, of course, usually if you just have a holomorphic function, you can have an essential singularity at zero. But the claim is that if you assume that the function is definable, this will not occur. Uh, then zero is not an essential singularity. In fact, uh, so this means that f has to be meromorphic. So uh, this is very striking. You are killing uh, uh, the bad guys uh, from complex analysis, uh, assuming you are definable. And the proof is uh, uh, easy if you know uh, the great Picard theorem, because uh, otherwise, if the function uh, has an essential singularity, then by great Picard theorem, uh, you know that uh, uh, you know the structure of the closure of the graph. Uh, actually, uh, if you take the uh, graph, and then you remove, uh, you take its closure, you remove the graph itself, so just the boundary, then uh, the great Picard theorem tells you that uh, you have this inclusion. Um, but then this is a contradiction because if you look at the dimension of the R of uh, this uh, boundary, then this has to be the dimension of C, so this is the real dimension is two, but this is also the dimension of uh, gamma of F, and this is a contradiction to the definability of F. Okay, so that's a basic idea. And actually uh, what you obtain uh, 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 is uh, the following theorem, um, which is due to uh, Peter Zill and Starchenko. That tells you that uh, suppose that S uh, is a quasi projective variety. Let's say over C. So we can think that S is just the affine space over C. And suppose now that you have X, which is a subset in SN, uh, which is complex analytic, a closed subset and definable in some O minimal structure. So this makes sense because, because S is quasi-projective of a C, so it's, it's, it's canonically uh, 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 definable in R alge, and so in any structure extending R alge. Uh, uh, then the claim is that you have, if you have such a subset, then actually uh, X is algebraic.
So you see that uh, this is a version of uh, the classical Chao theorem. So Chao theorem tells you that if you have uh, S, which is projective, so you can think this is a projective space, and you have a complex analytic subset of a projective uh, variety, then actually it has to be algebraic. But here, uh, I'm not assuming projectivity. I'm assuming only quasi-projectivity, but uh, uh, I'm assuming that the subset is definable. So I'm controlling what happens at infinity. So you can call this uh, O-minimal Gaga, if you want. Um, O-minimal Chao. And there is a version of the uh, Gaga theorem too, but I will not enter this. Okay, so now uh, that I have made this crash course in uh, O-minimal geometry, uh, I can move to application to Hodge theory. And uh, the motto is that uh, Hodge theory is tamed. So uh, what is the theorem? So I'm interested now in period maps. So the theorem is the following. So um, this is a theorem of uh, myself uh, with Baker and Timmerman. So it says that uh, first of all, the targets of uh, uh, the targets of the period maps. So if you take uh, D mod gamma, has a natural R alg uh, structure. So it is definable in the structure R alg such that. Uh, for any, of course, you want it to be factorial in some sense, such that any uh, d prime mod gamma prime inside uh, d mod gamma is actually uh, definable. So here, when I uh, write this, I mean that d prime is given by a subgroup g prime of g, and all these embeddings are coming uh, uh, from uh, that morphism. So that's the first part of the theorem. This is, uh, and uh, maybe I will comment a little bit later. And so suppose now that you have a period map. So, so suppose that you have a period map. So if uh, V uh, of uh, S, so S is as always a smooth quasi-projective of a C. No, just a question. Sure. What is R R structure? R R structure means that uh, on that thing, yes, uh, thanks for the, I, I was very fast because I didn't write. So this means that I can cover D mod gamma by finitely many charts, which are real semi-algebraic and such that the change of coordinates are real semi-algebraic. Does it answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, and uh, then uh, is uh, ZVHS with period map phi from SN to D mod gamma, then, uh, uh, then phi is uh, actually uh, R and X definable. So maybe uh, I should uh, spend some time here explaining uh, uh, the statement. So the first part of the statement, as I just mentioned, means that you can cover uh, D mod gamma by finitely many charts, which are semi-algebraic, and such that the change of coordinates are semi-algebraic. And moreover, if you write D prime mod gamma prime, mod gamma prime sorry, uh, in those charts, then uh, 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 it is given by a semi-algebraic immersion. So that's the first part. It's not too difficult. This is basically a reduction theory. Um, uh, uh, the second part uh, is the following. So we have a period map. We know this is a complex analytic map. What I'm claiming is that uh, on the right, uh, I have this R L structure on D mod gamma that I can uh, extend to an R and X structure. I just keep the same, uh, the same, same charts. But now I think of them uh, uh, as a change of coordinates being in R and X. And uh, now uh, on the left, I have this uh, complex algebraic variety. And we also saw that those things are also definable in R alg. So actually, both sides, S n and D mod gamma, are definable in R alg. So of course, I'm not claiming that the map phi is real semi-algebraic. 
but I'm claiming that to write uh, this map phi, this period map, uh, with respect to those finitely many charts, you need only real analytic functions restricted to compact boxes and the real exponential. Nothing more. You don't have a very strange uh, functions uh, outside of those ones. And so, uh, uh, in particular, the topological property of that phi uh, 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 are kind of uh, very reasonable. So, um, okay, so maybe tomorrow I will try to give an idea how you prove this, but uh, what I want to do now is just uh, mention uh, applications. So first of all, I claim that uh, 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 as an easy, from this result, uh, you get a, a very easy proof of the catani de link kaplan theorem, namely the algebraicity of the Hodge locus, right? Because uh, uh, let's look at the following diagram. So uh, uh, recall that uh, uh, what was the claim? The claim is that if you have uh, your period map d mod uh, phi from um, S n uh, to d mod gamma, then the claim was that if you have a d prime mod gamma prime, which is strictly contained in this, and here I take phi minus one of d prime mod gamma prime, And uh, the claim we want to show is that uh, phi minus one of this d prime mod gamma prime is algebraic, right? This is our goal. But uh, just contemplate the diagram. So you know that uh, the map phi, uh, uh, phi is definable. So first of all, phi is complex analytic. And uh, d prime mod gamma prime inside D mod gamma is C analytic. So you know that uh, phi minus one of D prime mod gamma prime is C analytic. But now uh, contemplating this diagram, you also know that uh, this map is definable. So this is definable even in R alge, but so in R, in R well, let's say in R alge. And you know that the map is definable in R and X. So this means that phi minus one of D prime mod gamma prime inside SN is definable in R and X. But then uh, I can just apply Petersen and Starchenko. And it tells you that uh, this subset phi minus one D prime mod gamma prime is at the same time complex analytic and definable in some o minimal structure, so it has to be algebraic. Okay, so it looks very clean. At least it gives you some conceptual explanation, why uh, more conceptual explanation of why this is uh, correct. So, uh, and uh, at that point, it's it's the right time to uh, give very precise definition uh, of a special subvarieties, but I think I already did it. Uh, so, but let me write it maybe. Is that a special subvariety of S for V uh, is uh, some guy Y of the form phi minus one of some d prime mod gamma prime for d prime coming from a uh, Mumford subgroup g prime of g. And then I take one irreducible component. So this zero means irreducible component. Um, and I have to be more precise, maybe. Let me write it this way dy mod gamma y, irreducible component, where uh, uh, gy dy is a junk. Mumford date <clears throat> datum of uh, the restriction of V to uh, Y. And actually what you can prove uh, is the following uh, thing is that Y 
inside S irreducible is uh, special if it is maximal among the uh, the Z irreducible inside S with the same uh, generic monophotic group. So this is a theorem. This is not the, you could take this as an equivalent definition. So uh, another result, maybe another corollary uh, that I want to mention. So maybe it was A, and then I want to mention uh, another result uh, is the following uh, theorem due to Becker, uh, Brune Barbe, and Zimmerman. Which answers an old uh, conjecture of Griffiths that tells you, uh, okay, let's look at that map, phi, your period map. Uh, we know that this map is not algebraic, but actually using uh, the previous uh, theorem about the definability and working an on, on, uh, on, on minimal version of the Gaga theorem, you can prove the following is that there exists an algebraic variety T such that. Uh, Actually, uh, this period map uniquely factorizes through uh, a closed immersion of uh, Tn uh, inside T. So where S to T is a dominant algebraic and uh, uh, T is quasi-projective. In other words, what it tells you is that the image of any period map as a canonical uh, quasi-projective structure. So this was proven a long time ago by Griffiths if the image is smooth, but in general, it's kind of tricky. And uh, you, uh, I don't think there is an algebraic proof of this result without uh, the O minimality. All right, so uh, I think I will stop here, but uh, you see that uh, uh, using this O minimal format in some sense, it, it put us in a good, uh, in a good uh, position for understanding really the geometry of the Hodge locus because we have much more control. We know that period maps are actually topologically uh, tame, they are kind of nice, they are complex analytic, not algebraic, but not so far from being algebraic. Okay, so maybe I will stop here and uh, wait for your questions. Are there any questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>